I start a brand new preaching series today and I pray that it would be a blessing to you. I feel that it is an absolute necessity in my soul that we as a church and the church at large, we understand clearly what it means to be reformed, what it means to be reformed. I feel so passionately about it. That happens to be the theme of our Passion Conference this year in April 18th through the 20th. It is RE hyphen formed, going back to the original form, the design that God intended for the church and for the Christian. And uh, we understand that there are times that we need to go back to be, somebody say, reformed. Reform. Years ago in Europe, they had sanitariums. These sanitariums were our equivalent of what we might call mental institution or psychological hospitals. It was there that they housed patients that were psychologically unstable and they offered treatment. But to determine whether or not a patient was ready to be uh, administered back into society again, whether or not they were sane enough to be able to cope. They didn't have the modern testing devices and methodology that we have today, so they would perform what may be considered some crude tests. One of the so-called tests was they would take a patient and bring him to a janitor's closet, and then they would take a stopper and put it in the drain of a janitor's sink, turn the water on full blast, and the water would overflow out of the sides of the janitor's tub. Then they'd bring the patient in and hand the patient a mop and set him inside the janitor's closet. No doubt the patient would start mopping up the water. But after the patient was mopping up the water, the test to determine whether or not you were ready to go back into society again is not only could you clean up the mess, but can you identify with the source and the origin of the mess, i.e. pull the stopper out of the drain and shut the water off to eliminate the problem altogether. Body Christ Church, I got a question for you. Because the reality is, we live in an absolute mess today. And I'm gonna ask you, because I understand that there are many of us, not only in the church, but our government institutions and so forth, they're trying to clean up the mess. But I wanna ask, are you spiritually sane? If you're spiritually sane, it means that you're not only a part of the process to clean up and mop up the mess of this world, but you can identify with the origin and the source of how we got in this mess in the first place and tap your neighbor and say, it's time to pull the plug on the drain and shut the water off. We live in a messy world. It's not just messy. It's a world of absolute confusion and chaos. If I could go back and date myself, I grew up with the temptations in a song called Ball of Confusion. Even back then, the lyrics were like this. People moving out, people moving in. Why? Because of the color of the skin. Run, 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 but your show can't hide. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Vote for me and I'll set you free. Rap on, brother. Rap on. The only person talking about love thy brother is the preacher. And the only one who's interested in learning is the teacher. Segregation, determination, demonstration, integration, aggravation, humiliation, obligation to our nation. Ball of confusion. Oh yeah, that's what the world is today. Who oh, yeah. That song was written in the late 60s. And this is what I realized after reading through those lyrics. Nothing has changed. The same issues they were addressing in the 60s and 70s are the same issues that we are confronted with today. It's a mess. It's a ball of confusion. And yet when I turn on the news, and I listen to the, watch the reports of the chaos and the confusion in the world that we live in. And then they bring on and they interview the so-called experts. And here's what I notice about the so-called experts. They all start off with phrases like this. Well, I feel, 
and the way I see it, or the research and studies have shown us. But how do we sift through these claims? Because what they're really saying is, I see it, I feel, research has shown us, but I still don't know. How do we sift through these claims? How do people know what is absolutely right about morality, what's, what's right or true about humanity in general, about race and race relations, about the origin of the universe, and ultimately about a supreme God? Whatever the questions might be, how do we know that people are absolutely right? In order to answer certain questions and the questions about life and those things I just mentioned, we got to have some norm. We have to have a standard, if you will. We have to have a criteria which is absolutely perfect in terms of the basis of truth. In other words, we need an ultimate and absolute authority. And so when we talk about how do we come to conclusions of truth, many people use reason or they use logic as their basis for truth. And if it's not reason or logic, then they use their sensory experiences. Well, because I've experienced this, I've gone through this, and, and here's the things that I've dealt with in my environment or socially or psychologically. So I've come to this conclusion on that basis. But we gotta move beyond reason and logic to adjudicate all these competing ideas that compete against, if you will, the truths of God. It's, when we talk about absolute truth, we gotta look at where that absolute truth or the origin of the absolute truth might be. Uh, can I just take a minute? When we think about absolute truth, <clears throat> we understand that amongst Christians historically and Amongst Christ, and in Christianity itself, we've always relied on the supreme authority of God, and the supreme authority of God has always been revealed through the supreme authority of his written word. Somebody say written word. Not just what was spoken, but was written in the scriptures itself. But now we have to examine why I believe the word of God is absolutely true. Not just because a book says that it's true. Well, first of all, let's look at the world that we live in. Not only today, but throughout antiquity since its beginning, its origin. When we look at the world today, look at it as a bubble. And here's what we do know. Everything inside of this bubble, inside of this circle, is flawed, it's imperfect, and it's impure. Am I right about it? Yeah, yeah. And so therefore, every system in this bubble, in this world, is flawed. And the reason why every system is flawed is because every ide ideology that, that, if you will, fuels the system, thinking, is flawed. And the reason why every ideal is flawed to some degree is because every single person in this world is flawed and imperfect. We all have our flaws. None of us are perfect in our thinking and in our reasoning. And so therefore, when we look for the absolute basis of truth, we cannot look at what's in the circle. You've got to go outside of the circle and find something or someone who is absolutely pure in their origin, and listen to this, and not only are absolute pure in their origin, but is without flaw, without imperfection, who is absolutely perfect, listen, who is not dependent on anything that's in the circle or influenced by anything in the circle, but is interdependent on himself. And the only one I can think of is God. So God lives outside the circle. He is our eternal truth. If you want absolute truth, we have to go to the scriptures. Not even looking absolutely to the preacher in the pulpit, but to the scriptures themselves. I am flawed like everything else in this Bible, a bottle, a bottle or this bubble rather. And not the Bible, but the bubble. <laughs> the, the Bible is not flawed. And so therefore, what I'm giving you is I'm extracting and extrapolating what I believe is biblical truth based on my studies. From exegeting the text, 
But at the same token, you can know the truth for yourself as a result of the scriptures. And so when we talk about Christ being the absolute basis of our truth, God that is, we got to now ask ourselves the question. But what happens when the truth of God falls into hand, to the hands of sinful and corrupt men and women who have been called or at least designed to be agents of God and dispensers of that truth? But they manipulate that truth for their own reasons and their own gain. That's where we are. Let's take a walk through history. Is that all right? Y'all willing to go with me? Let's go all the way back to first century Christianity in the apostolic age, the days of Peter, Paul, and John, Paul spreading the gospel in the Greco-Roman Empire, Peter, Peter primarily in Israel around Jerusalem, first, first preaching the gospel, the truths of God to the Jews and then to the Gentile community. And as the word of God began to grow, there were people all over the Greco-Roman Empire, people in Northern Africa and all over the world, the known world at that time, that were embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the same token, they were under Roman auspices or the, the, the uh, authority of the Roman government. And Rome felt like Christianity was a threat. It's because the more they persecuted and threatened Christians and the preachers to stop preaching, the more they arrested and even executed Christians, they realized they were like Bebe's kids. They just don't die, they multiply. And understanding this threat and this authority and this talk about there is a king of kings that is coming back to sit on the throne. Then Rome made a decisive action under the, uh, the, the, the direction of the Roman Empire Constantine in 1313 AD. Not at that point to necessarily legalize Christianity, but to abolish all other religions and consider them as pagan. Now, the reason why Constantine made this move is for financial reasons. I don't want to go through all the, the details, but the denarii, the, the currency of the Roman government had lost its value. And the Roman government had to think of ways fast that they could make money. This is what they knew. One, Christian influence is spreading and is dominating all of Rome. So if you can't beat them, you need to join them and certainly control them. So by wiping out all pagan religions, and understand that there are thousands of pagan temples all over the Roman provinces. And by shutting them down and banning the religion of them, they understood that what they all had in common is almost like church. They collected money and then they kept that money in the treasuries in these idol temples. So by shutting them down, they sent their soldiers out to confiscate all the money in the temples and to take all of the trinkets and the statues and to sell them and everything of value. But you talk about cha-ching and putting some money back in the Romans' pockets. That's exactly what they did. And then in 3D, uh, 380 uh, AD, Emperor, Emperor Theodius I, he came and now made Christianity the official religion of Rome. The official religion of Rome, again, for control and financial gain. Stick with me. For control and financial gain. It was all based on money. And so what they decided to do is that the Roman government will now say to certain Christians, we want you to be the leaders of the Christian church, but you work for us, under us. We're the governing body. We say what you can and what you cannot do. And so they set up these systems in what would be called, as we know it now, the Roman Catholic Church. It was Roman because Rome oversaw, started, founded the church, and it's Catholic because the word Catholic means one. So therefore, there's only one church that is recognized by the government and sanctioned by the government and overseen by the government, and everybody else is going to get killed if you do anything different here we are, the Roman Catholic Church. So, all for the sake of money and control, they appointed their hierarchies within the ecclesiastical orders. 
all of the, the priests. So they took what Christ said, or Paul said, ultimately, is the priesthood of all believers, that all of us as believers are priests. All of us can pray to God through Jesus Christ ourselves. But they took that, now they have a priesthood, listen to me carefully, and they taught that mankind cannot go to God in prayer for himself. You have to have a mediator and an intercessor between man and God, and that is the priest and the priesthood. So therefore, understanding all of us sins, all of us, all of sin, and we're guilty, and we have a guilty conscience, then you need to go to the priest so that tell the priest your sins and the priest will pray on your behalf. Now you still don't know if you're forgiven by God of your sins until the priest tell you that you're forgiven, but you still got to buy all of these trinkets, you got to buy all of these phylacteries, if you will, and guess who was selling them and making the money? The Roman government. But then they came along with all of these man-made rules and ideas in the church. So instead of preaching the grace of God for our salvation in the finished work of Christ, and every man and woman or anyone of reasonable age can make a conscientious decision to either accept or reject Jesus Christ, to get you in the church, they sprinkle you at birth or in infancy. And that sprinkling, not regeneration and conversion, but for the simple sprinkling, that is what made you a Christian. Now, if you want to maintain your Christianity, you have to continue with the mass. As a matter of fact, in that day and time, it was mandatory that you attend mass. Government rule is the law. And so in attending mass, then you had to adhere to ordinances, one of them, which we commonly call communion, that they phrase Eucharist. Understand this, they believe that Christ's body, and still to this day, when they participate in communion, when they eat the bread, that bread literally turns into the flesh of Jesus Christ. You are consuming Christ's body. Not only that, but when you drink of the wine, you are consuming the actual blood of Jesus Christ. And that is the continuance of the grace in your life for salvation. But not only that, they came up with ideas like purgatory, which aren't biblical at all. That there's this intermediate place and state that when you die, you don't either go directly to heaven or hell. You go to a holding ground, the waiting room. It's because all of us have some unrepented and unforgiven sins that we did not pay for. And so therefore you go there and your loved ones who are still alive offer mass on your behalf, but you gotta pay the priest in order to have the mass, i.e. the service, and you have to pray, pay for a penance. It's all about money and control. Still not knowing if your loved one is out of purgatory and into heaven, so you gotta keep on doing it. Then we go from the Eucharist to purgatory to all of these indulgence, all this indulgence, and then the idol worship of statues and the dead saints that is strictly forbidden to pray to and through in the Bible. And then on top of that, they literally worship Mary, who they ascribe the title, the mother of God. Not just the mother of Jesus, but the mother of God. And so in that, they give her three, if you will, attributes. That she is co which means just as Jesus is our redeemer, then the grace of God flows through Mary to be our redeemer. She is co but not only co she is co which means she is our mediator. So that when we pray and offer our prayers to the priest, the priest prays, but the prayers go through Mary before it gets to Jesus and unto God. Not only that, but she is co-advocate, what we call avictric, which simply means that she is our advocate on our behalf praying for us. And all of the graces of God, again, towards us flows through Mary. It's pagan. And then beyond all of that, then they come up with not only, again, this ecclesiastical order of, of the priests, the bishops, but they also have the papacy, which is the office of the pope, who again is appointed by the government. And the pope sits in ex cathedra every so often and gets divine revelation from God on various subject matters, no matter what is written in the scripture, but he can turn it. It says that's not what God originally meant or what he means. And so here's the new order and rule of the day. 
None of that is biblical. And so for 1,500 years, 1,500 years, Christianity spread throughout the entire Roman Empire and the world around it, but the government ruled the church. Again, it was not only mandatory, again, for all citizens to attend church, but neither could anyone, any citizen, have a copy of the Bible. The only ones that could have a copy of the Bible was the church, and it was chained to the pulpit. If you ever caught as a citizen even trying to read the Bible, you could be executed. And not only that, listen to this, not only was it mandatory that you attend church on every Sunday, but the services were three to four hours long. Never point your finger at the Pentecostals and Missionary Baptists. <laughs> you talking about missing the, gold, the buffet at Golden Corral on Sunday. You would definitely miss the, the buffet. And so they were in church for three to four hours on Sunday morning. And listen to this, mandatory. You had to go three to four hour services. And the entire service was in Latin, which none of the hearers understood or spoke. 1,500 years, the Bible, the Word of God, was locked in the Latin Vulgate or the Latin, Latin language. And it was against the law to translate it or to copy it into another language and to distribute it. The truth of God became now in the hands of man, not only polluted, but because of polity and because of people who wanted to control the minds and the consciousness and the wills of other human beings and oftentimes doing it for their own personal gain. Somebody shout, thanks be to God. But thanks be to God by the grace and the province of a sovereign God. It was the 10th of November, 1483 in Eiselben, Germany, that the parents, Hans and Margarita Luther, gave birth to their son named Martin Luther, or as we know him, Martin Luther. His father was, a, was a, a copper miner and lived by meager means, but they were Catholic and he raised their son in the church. He always wanted the best for his son and so he made sure that he saved so Martin Luther could go to college and get an education and get a good job. In one year, Martin Luther earned his bachelor's degree. In one year, for y'all's five and six year veterans. In three years, he earned his master's degree. And according to his father's plan and wanting to please his father, he attended law school. Halfway through law school, in 1505, he was in the middle, literally, on campus of a lightning storm and thought he was going to lose his life in this storm. And so he prayed out to God through St. Anne, Lord, if you deliver me from this storm, I'll dedicate my life to you in the priesthood. Sure enough, God delivered him not wanting it initially to keep his word, but understood that his word to God was bond. He dropped out of law school and went to the Catholic church and joined the monastery, was re-educated in, in the scriptures. And it was in, in 1507 that he was ordained for the priesthood. In 1508, he began to teach theology at the University, University of Wittenberg in Germany. But something happened. He began to really examine the scriptures for their actual worth. He saw all of the indulgence and all of the practices of the Catholic Church. He saw the hierarchy and the order, and he saw how people were reading one thing in scripture, but then changing it and manipulating the scripture when they gave it to the people. And so therefore, in studying primarily the book of Romans, he came to this conclusion that we're way off basis and something must be done about it. So he asked, if you will, for a hearing. Don't forget the church and the government was linked together. But they denied this hearing because he wanted to refute some of the doctrinal beliefs of the church, the Catholic church. And then on October 31st, 1517, on Halloween day, young Martin Luther took his 95 thesis 95 areas of disagreement, if you will, that he had against the church. And he nailed that 95 thesis to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Someone said the hammer strokes had echoed all throughout Europe. And what he believed is what that centrally that the doctrine of the Bible alone, the scriptures alone was the ultimate authority 
and was the formal principle that led to the Reformation. So in 1521, the historic interrogation of Martin Luther came before the Diet of Worms. What a name. But you got to understand what it means. Diet means an assembly or a council, and Worms happened to be the town in Germany where this court hearing took place. So they brought him into the Diet of Worms, and there they asked him after reading this 95 thesis to recant what he had written to change your belief about the church, or you're gonna to have to suffer judgment. These are the words I quote of Martin Luther in that hearing regarding him recanting his statements and conviction about the scriptures. Unless I am overcome with testimonies from scripture or with evident reasons, for I believe neither the Pope nor the church or excuse me, nor the councils, since they have often erred and contradicted one another, I am overcome by the scripture text, which I have adduced, and my conscience is bound by the word of God, end of quote. What he was saying is, and not unless I see it in the scriptures, I will not believe it, because the only thing that will ever govern my conscience again is the word of God and not man. It was Martin Luther that God used to not only have this protest against the church, but it was God that used him to set Christians free and ultimately to set the word of God free again. And his protest is how we now have the term Protestant. is because he protested against what was considered the one and only church, the Roman Catholic Church. So anyone and everyone who is in a church that is not Roman Catholic are considered protesters. And that's the reason why whether you're Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, whatever you might be, you are now a protester, Protestant in faith. And so with this state of execution against them, they understood that we cannot bring judgment on them today because of his popularity, it might spur a riot. So they basically said to him, we're going to let you go and think about this so you can come back and recant for the next hearing. And in terminology we will use today, Luther skipped bail. He was snuck out of the city, snuck out of the country by groups like the Anabaptists and others. And there his life was preserved for ministry, but he influenced many others, even through Calvin, John Calvin and Calvinism, John Wesley and many other leaders that came after him. But God even used Martin Luther to translate the Bible from Latin into now its first translation from Latin to German. And then in 1611, and we have our first English translation of the Bible as a result of the work of Luther. And then in 1622, the official approved version by the King of England, King James, that's why it's called the authorized version. Not because God authorized it, <laughs> But because the king was the only one who could make a declaration and by law says that this book can be put in another language and it can be copied and or distributed. Because the government still ran the church. Now, after all of that. Here we are some 500 years later. And yet the truth of God is still being challenged. It's being challenged not only by cultural views and cultural values. The culture has come up with ideas like non-absolutism. In other words, there is no such thing as absolute truth. Truth is subjected to each person based on whatever that truth, basis of that truth might be. It could be relative truth. If it's relative to me, it may not be relative to you, but I have my own set of ground of truth. The truth of God is being challenged by religious pluralism, humanism, secularism, all under the banner of tolerance. But you know what, church, I'm not that concerned about how the world and culture views the truth of God. I'm really, really concerned about how the church, Christians view the word of God. It is not the view of the world that shapes the view of the truths of God. It's because the world hasn't been called by God to take his truth to the world. The church has been called by God 
to stand on, to live by, and to our values and views to be shaped by the word of God and to take this same gospel, which is the power of God for salvation, to the world. But if we don't know the word of God, and if we are confused, and if we have adapted to the cultural views or to the traditions of the church, and if our conscience has been mastered, if you will, by the will of man, then we're in a quandary. We're in a bad predicament. So now you got a problem that we had some 500 to 1500 years ago. The problem is not the word's contradiction, it's the world's contradiction of the scriptures. Listen to me carefully. And I don't set myself on no pedestal. The greatest problem we have in the church today is charlatans in the pulpit. Those who willfully or ignorantly preach the word of God without proper exegesis of the text, without a heart, without a heart that's turned to God in humility. But now what we have in the pulpits are modern day prophets who always presenting before the people of God are thus said the Lord. God spoke to me this morning. I saw God in a vision the other day. God's sister just told me to tell you this, charlatans. It's called extra biblical revelation. In other words, there's a revelation that is given outside of the written text itself that God warns us against. And why is it done? For the same reason it was done 1,500 years ago. It was done for mind control. It was done, it's done for authority and power over people. And the bottom line is it puts money in your pockets. And so no wonder we can mix in not only culturalism, but the values and the views, if you will, of materialism and material gain through health and wealth gospels. Or we can preach legalism where we keep God's people bound in chain, where they have to keep coming back to us because you're not going to get the word of God. You're not going to be blessed and you're not going to be set free. None less God does it through me to you. I'm your mediator. I'm co-redeemer with Jesus. I'm co-advocate. And they'll use passages of scriptures like, how can they hear except they have a preacher and how can he preach except he be sent? They decontextualize that passage where they attain supremacy over God's people. Tap your neighbor and say, it's time to put that foolishness behind us. It's time for a second reformation. In the Reformation of Luther and his 95 Thesis, it could be summed up in these five points because what he pointed out was and what bothered him most about the Roman Catholic Church is about their view, which was non-biblical, regarding salvation. Our greatest dilemma is that we're sinners lost in our sins, dead in our sins and trespasses, and we need Christ and Christ alone is the one who can save us. But when you have a salvation that's based on works, it's based on effort, it's based on tradition, then you nullify the cross of Christ. So if you could sum up what has been done through the Reformation movement, if you will, the 95 Thesis of Martin Luther, it would fall into these five categories. They're called the solas, S-O-L-A-S. In the Latin, which simply means solely or alone. And it begins with where we began today, sola scriptura. The scriptures and the scriptures alone. And then there is sola Christ or Christos, which means solely Christ alone. And then there is solely grace, solely by faith, solely for the glory of God. Five areas in these next five weeks that we're going to contemplate and be bothered by the word of God until we get our right focus. Today, sola scriptura. 
That was my introduction, but the body is not as long in this sermon as the introduction. What happens to the word of God as a result of these vain traditions, man-made standards and rule and control? First of all, <clears throat> because of the accumulated traditions of man-made systems and men that come alongside of the scripture with their own authority, we have emptied the word of God of its power. We wonder why we don't see the effects that we saw in the first century church with Christians and the power of God and the grace of God unfold like it did back then. It is not, it's not, not because, you know, we're not giving money. It's not because, you know, we're not faith. No, no, no. It's because we have a problem with the preached word. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 15, verse 6. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Because of your, you, you allow tradition like the Roman Catholic Church to govern, if you will, and control the actual written script. In other words, tradition and the papacy and the ecclesiastical orders of the church, they have become divine authority and not the word of God speaking for itself. Paul addressed the Colossians and said it this way in his short letter to the Colossians, Colossians 2 and 8. And he says, here, here is, here is what, happened, what has happened to us even to this day. You have been taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the, listen, elemental spirits of the world. In other words, it is not just heresy. It is not just false teaching, not just inaccurate teaching. He said it is rooted, if you will, in demonic spirits. It is not just an error. It is demonic in nature. It's either the truth of God or it is a lie of the devil who is the father of lies. Now I didn't make it up. He says according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Whenever we put the traditions of men and the, the authority of the preacher and the speaker and their office alongside of the word of God and make them equal, it's a travesty. It waters down the gospel of Jesus Christ and make it of no effect. Because now it's not the word of God that's the absolute authority over the conscience of men and women. But now it is the person in the pulpit. And so, <clears throat> secondly... The Bible is clear and forbids all of us in any time and dispensation to add or to take away from the scriptures. Again, we refer to it theologically as extra biblical revelation. I mean, all forms, all knowledge or experience which gives us supposedly information concerning God, his work and his will, which is not directly quoted in the scripture in its proper context. It is heresy. And he forbids us to trust in it. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2, the law of God even in the Old Testament. Listen to what God says. You shall not add to the word which I command you nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. He says, rely on the word that I command you, the word that I give you, not what these people come along and what they say that I said. You will know my word from the written law inscribed in stone that is written on papyrus, delivered by the prophets of God. Matter of fact, in Revelation 22, how does the book close? The book closes in Revelation 22 in verse 18, in this way, for I testify to everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, if anyone adds a thus said the Lord, in other words, God is giving me another word outside of the canonized scriptures in these 66 books. This is what he says should happen or will happen. If you add to it, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. It's a dangerous thing to say, here's what thus said the Lord, or to give a poor representation of even when, because you know, we're going to always throw in a verse here or there. 
Sometimes you may wonder, oh, he takes so long, why is he giving 10, 12, 15 verses or different passages of scripture? It don't take all of that. But what would you rather for me to do? Give you one verse of scripture and then for the next 35, 40 minutes give you Calvin? What would you rather for me to do? Give you a short version of the parable or, or some narrative of a story of David and Goliath and then not giving you all the supporting scripture from the actual word of God, but I go ahead and give you my term. Or would you rather know, read, reference the word of God itself for yourself in its proper context? It takes a little time to do that. As you can take anything Psalms 14, verse 1, the psalmist says, and atheists back it up, there is no God. But the context says, a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Jesus warned us, no, excuse me, the writer of Proverbs in the Old Testament talks about the difference between the word of man that says it's from God and God actually himself in the written text. Psalms 30 verse 5 says, every word of God is pure. Did y'all hear that? My words are not pure. No man's, woman's words are pure, but God's word is pure. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. And listen to this, do not add to his words. Least he rebuke you and you be found a liar. I think if we go back and exercise the Old Testament laws and principles, that God had established and even in Deuteronomy he says, listen, if someone says that they're a prophet and they prophesy and it don't come to pass, they should be executed. I think we wouldn't have so many people that want to jump up in a pulpit and talk about their prophets and apostles now. You double check and triple check, I got a word from the Lord. <laughs> Jesus warned us about false prophets to come in Matthew 24 and 11. He says, then many false prophets will rise up and they will deceive many. That's the goal, deception. They, they will rise up. Many will rise up. And listen, they're going to tack. They're going to, they look like it. They, they wearing two piece suits. Yeah, you're talking about, you know what I'm talking about? They look like, they look like the preacher. We all look the same. To some degree, we may even sound the same. But are we preaching for the same basis, for the same reason, purpose, and cause? Paul said it this way to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians verse 14, 37. If anyone thinks of himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Paul said, now this is not, I, the commandments of the Lord means I can go back and verify what I am saying and what I am writing based on the commandments of the Lord, which came from written texts. You think that you're a prophet or that you're somebody spiritual. Paul says, understand the way we do this and on what basis. It's not, a, huh, I got a word from the Lord. I got a written text to stand firmly on. There was a time when God spoke directly, directly to people. And they not only spoke, but they wrote his words. What we know now is scripture. But understand that, that God may have used them and allowed them to write out of their personalities. He might have used them and allowed them to pin, if you will, out of their experience, Paul and Silas in a jail cell. But what they wrote was as a result of what God breathed through them. Listen to what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture, somebody say all scripture, all written text in the Bible is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration means it is God breathed. Just as God breathed his spirit, if you will, and his word into Adam when he was a lump of dirt and he became a living soul, God has breathed through his prophets and he has breathed through the lawgiver and he has breathed through his apostles of old. So he allowed them to write, if you will, out of their free will, but what they wrote was the breath of God. The same breath of God is like the wind of God that controls a sailboat. The sailboat is autonomous and the sailors in the boat is autonomous. You can try to turn it this way and steer that way, but when the wind is stronger, 
than the man controlling the rudder. Then the wind will take the boat wherever it wants it to go. That's why you know that it's always accurate because it is inspired by God. Now we say, I was inspired to write this song. That's human inspiration. I was inspired to write this poem. So, uh, but that's human inspiration. There's a difference between human inspiration and the actual breath of God. But listen to this carefully, church. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it's for this purpose. Listen carefully. It's for this purpose on behalf of the Christian, the reader. God says, I'm giving you the word and it ought to produce something. This is what he says. And the word of God is given by the breath of God and is profitable for. It is profitable. There is gain out of it. Now listen to me carefully because we got to measure what's being said and what's being preached by what the word of God is designed to do. It is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine means simp uh, 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 um, uh, core beliefs and values from God's estimation. And there's belief theologically that it's probably eight to 12 major doctrines within the Christian faith and within the scriptures. In other words, a doctrine would be, a system of study would be, uh, what does God say about God? What does God say about Christ? What does God say about the Holy Spirit? Those are all doctrines. What does God say about man and the depravity and nature of man? What does God say about salvation? What does God say about ecclesiology? What does God say about the church, the role and function of the church? What does God say uh, about uh, 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 future things, eschatology? Those are all doctrines. But here's a problem. When I hear preaching today, I don't hear doctrine. I hear the devilish devise of man's words, lifting up man from the pages, but not doctrine from the pages. But it's not only for doctrine, but it's for reproof. The word of God is designed to show us as a mirror before God where we're wrong, where we're impure, where we're unrighteous. The word of God is not designed to make us feel good about ourselves every time we leave church. It's designed to reprove us. We can't be shaped to the image of Christ and likeness of Christ if we're not reproved. If, we're not, if Calvin is not shown from the word of God, God himself, where my wrong is, I can never live righteously. It's for reproof. But thank God he didn't just leave us showing us our wrong, but it's also designed, the word of God, for correction. He corrects us and shows us the right way. But then he goes from there, the fourth thing, an instruction in righteousness. He instructs us in the way that we ought to live righteous, right or the right way. The way we should think, our motives, our heart, what we should do, our questions are answered through the word of God because we are instructed in righteousness for this reason, that the man of God, woman of God, may be complete Thoroughly equipped for every good word. We come that we might hear the preached word, that we might be thoroughly equipped so that when we leave here, we can do the work of the Lord. But when I hear materialism and covetousness being preached in the church, when I hear all the me-ism and it's about me and it's about you, I don't hear doctrine, I don't hear reproof, I don't hear correction, I don't hear instructions in righteousness. And I certainly don't hear when you leave here, this is how we ought to live and how we ought to work for the glory and honor of God. The word of God, in other words, is designed to make us grow. When I read this passage the other day and came back to it, revisit, revisited it on yesterday, and I was thinking, but Lord, so therefore, why is it the churches are not growing? Meaning, i.e., not just the number of constituency, the people that make up the church. But why are people not growing? And there's one of three reasons. Number one, there's a great possibility, and I'll start with this, that the word of God is not being preached in the church. I know that ain't a problem here, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Even if it ain't me, whoever stands here, we're going to make sure they give the written, the preached word of God through the written script 
by the Holy Ghost. But secondly, it's not a bragging statement. So then I said, okay, if we got to preach the word of God and people are still not growing, not just this church, wherever the church might be, they got to preach the word of God and the individuals individually are not growing, then there's got to be another reason. It's because they are not submitting themselves to the word of God in obedience. They're Christian, but they're not submitting themselves to the word. You hear it. You say amen, air nine then. But are you submitting yourself to the will as well to the word of God? Are we obeying? Are we living it out? Then third, I had to go drastic in my thoughts. Okay, people in a church where they preach the Bible, the Bible, the word of God is being preached. And there's some folk who are hearing and obeying. So what about the rest of the folk? Well, the question is, are they saved in the first place? That's the third thing. Churches are filled with unsaved folk. I'm not trying to trivialize and confuse you and you, I don't, sure, after that, I don't even know if I'm saved. You know that you're saved or not. Here's the design. The word of God is given to us for these four reasons that we might be thoroughly equipped and furnished, complete, right? And if we are not maturing, we're either not obeying the word of God or we need to put your salvation in check. Because anything that is healthy grows. And if we're not healthy, we will not grow. We will not mature. I don't care if you're 95 years old, head full of gray hair, you're bald like me. Just because you're old doesn't mean that you're wise and that you're mature. I've seen senior citizens that are just as selfish as some of the three-year-old children. The fact is, the scriptures, the word, written word of God, is a more sure word of God than some spoken word of prophecy. I am not making that up. what the word of God says. Peter addresses this and the idea that the word of God is a more sure word. Second Peter chapter one, verse 18. We ourselves, he said, heard this very voice born from heaven. We were on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember the gospel? We were up there with him, Peter, James, and John, invited to the mountaintop by Jesus. And what he says is, we heard and we saw the glory of the Lord. But he said, that ain't as sure as the written word of God. Listen to what he says. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have the prophetic word, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, more sure than when we were even on the mountain hearing the voice of God, to which we will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. In other words, Peter was saying the scriptures is the highest form of supremacy, the supremacy of God and authority of God over God's people. The scriptures. So therefore, it is the scriptures, the written word of God, and the written word of God only, that is the perfect and only standard of spiritual truth. The written word of God is infallible. All of heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand. That's what it means when we say sola scriptura by scripture alone. Here's the reason why that's so radically important and we, we don't distort the scriptures of God, the word of God. Because when you distort the scriptures or the word of God, what we say is the truth of God, you distort God himself. Here's the reason why the essence of truth, the foundation of truth, where all authoritative truth comes from, absolute truth, is from Christ himself. Here's the reason why. Because he is not just a giver of truth not just a promoter of truth. He himself, his person, he is truth. That's the reason why Jesus could say in John 14, 16, I am the way, isn't that what he says? I am the truth and I am the life. No man can come unto the Father except by me. I am inclusively and exclusively the way unto the Father and the way that I am the way unto the Father is through truth, but that truth is me, not just a part of me or not just given or spoken truth. As a matter of fact, if you look at the end of the story in Revelation chapter 19, I know y'all tired of this scripture stuff, right? We're gonna go home, we're gonna watch something else for about five or six hours, but hang in there with me for about 10 more minutes at the most. Revelation 19 and verse 2. Notice what John said he saw, which is ultimately Christ. 
His eyes were like a flame of fire. No, that ain't Uncle Ned drunk again, all right? Read it out. His eyes were like flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one except, uh, knew except himself. Listen to this. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. <laughs> Take it a step back. What did John open up his gospel with? He says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was not only with God, but the Word was God. Before the incarnation of Christ, God in human flesh, he was word incarnated. The way Jesus reveals himself is through when God says, let there be, and the text says in John, everything that was created was created by him, through him, and for him. And so therefore, when we look at the word of God, it was God who used the Father, who used the word of God, Christ, to create everything in the world. And to give life and meaning and purpose and significance to everything. But how did he do it? Through word. Who is word? Word is his son. That's why when we distort the word of God, we're distorting Christ. We're ultimately distorting God himself. Listen to this so we look at a timeline. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. The writer of Hebrews opens up with these words and notice, if you will, the timeline. God who in various ways or in different ways and in various, excuse me, various times and in various ways, different times and in different ways. Listen, he spoke in times past, somebody say past, to the fathers by the prophets. He spoke in times past to our forefathers, Old Testament in particular, through the prophets. But notice the timeline in the tense. In these last days, spoken to us by his son. We just talked about who son is. Son is the word of God. Son is, listen, the incarnate word of God. And so therefore, he says he's spoken to us through his son. How is his son revealed to us today? Through the written word of God. I, I'm closing for real. So in my conclusion, just want to give you something to think about. Three things, number one, There are no human authority, human agents, popes, priests, prophets, bishops, pastors, preacher, evangelist, teacher, who is equal in authority with the written word of God, and certainly not superior to. No human authority or any human system can come alongside and, and can claim equality with the written word of God, plain and simple. Secondly, if we go back to Martin Luther's statement, it, he makes it clear that we should never submit our conscience. Listen to this, never submit our conscience to human authority. And that human authority Although we submit, if you will, our allegiance, if you will, to human authority, but not our conscience. You might not like the current president. We might not like the current president. We might not like some of the policies, but God has appointed, Romans 13, 12 and 13, God has appointed, God has appointed every authority in the earth. Amen? Amen. We ought to respect to whatever degree that authority. But that is not the same thing. Like you're on your job. You might not even be a Christian, but you ought to submit yourself to that authority. But submitting ourselves to that authority is different than submitting our conscience to that authority. Our conscience is our will. Our conscience is what God has given us to determine right from wrong and where we pledge our allegiance to, our values. What is first to predominant and preeminent in our lives. <laughs> and you cannot allow someone to control your conscience. Only the word of God is designed to govern our conscience, not a human authority. And so when you come to church, don't check your brains in at the door and put them in a basket and your eyes in a bucket. See clearly, hear clearly, and think clearly for yourself. That's right. And then thirdly, Thirdly, here's the catcher right here. 
I'm always amazed, if not even perplexed, at how people can voluntarily come to church and put blindfolds on when it comes to the preached word of God and the authority in the church. It's, it's like we just come through the door and say, I can trust him because he's a man of God. He's gone to school. He's studied the word. He's spent time with God this week. And so therefore, I can trust him. Really? But we don't do that in any, every, any other arena in life. Right, check this out. So you're going to buy another car. You drive up on the auto lot with your car, get out the car, salesperson, all excited, got a customer, potential car, walk out. They say, how are we doing today? How can I help you? What, what can I show you? Well, you know what? It don't matter to me. It's like you've been doing this for years. You're like an authority. Tell you what, I'm going to let you pick out a little something, something for me, all right? And whatever you pick out for me, that's what I'm going to purchase. Matter of fact, just surprise me. I'm going to put the blindfold on, drive it up, sit me in it, and I'm going to buy it. And then they take you into the finance office, and they got 72 pieces of paper that you're supposed to read through documents, contract that you're supposed to sign for this loan. I don't see anybody that go in that office and say, you know what, you're the loan officer, you're like, you know what you're doing, you got a nice fancy desk, a couple degrees hanging on the wall. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna trust you. I ain't reading through all this paperwork. You, whatever terms and conditions you set up for me, matter of fact, I'm gonna put my blindfold on, just turn to the last page where I'm supposed to sign, put my hand over the signature line, and I'll go ahead and sign it for you. Do you do that? What about going to the doctor? Now we go to the doctor, but we're already doctors. You go to the doctor because I got a cough. I got, I got a doctor, I got a cough, my throat hurt. And the doctor says, oh, and my diagnosis, therefore the prognosis is this. We need to bring you, admit you into the hospital. We're gonna have to do surgery, drill a hole through your head, run a line down through your head and body and tie it around your toenails and pull it back up to get rid of this cough. Now I know that's extreme, right? But it didn't make any difference whether he can just prescribe or she uh, about some pills for you. I want you to take this medicine three times a day. And listen, when we leave that doctor's office, before we even get home, we're already in the parking lot Googling MD.com. We're everything else. We're going to, I ain't taking these pills. I don't know what's in them. And so you're going to read through what's in it. Still don't know what it is. Benzonite florenzine. And we're going to, I don't know. That don't sound right to me. I'm looking at the side effects to it. Now, they ain't operating on me. They ain't cutting me until, listen, I want a second opinion. I'm on, I, am I right about it? But then we come to church. Listen, would you consider marrying somebody you had never met, don't know anything about them? I'm talking about marrying, spending the rest of your life with this person. But you got a friend who knows you, knows what you like. And you say to your friend, look, I just want you to hook me up with somebody you think might be good for me so I can marry. Matter of fact, bring them over today. We're going to go down to Pastor Redmond. We're going to go down to Justice of the Peace. I'm going to put the blinders on. I don't even want to see him or her To after we had these vows, we get across the threshold into the hotel room on our honeymoon. I'm going to take the blinders out. I'm going to sign the paperwork and get my marriage license. Some of y'all thinking, well, I probably done better to do that than what I did. Nobody does that. Even the reality TV shows are not that bad. At least you got 30 days to check it out. 30 days of marriage, right? So why is it that we come to church and put the blinders on and say, just whatever you give me, I'll be satisfied. But please make me feel good about myself. Get me excited so I can jump a little bit. In Jesus' name. No, then I go home. I got all power. So whatever is attached to me, including these lottery tickets, I win. <laughs> but this is what Dr. Luke writes about the Bereans as I close. This is how we ought to be. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. These, the Bereans, were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. 37 miles southwest of Berea. Paul had gone through the preach to both of these areas, and this is what he says, but they were more, Paul, Luke says, they were more fair-minded, they were more open to, in their thinking, they were more open than those in Thessalonica. 
How is it? In that they received the word of God with all readiness. They were ready to apply the word of God, sitting on the edge of their seat. We not only want to hear, but we want to do. But then secondly, this is important. And they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And they searched the, what? The scriptures, the written word of God daily to find out of what the apostles themselves who had ate and slept with God, of what they were saying were really true. Not just ready to hear, but then they went home and they said, we're going to fact check a brother to make sure what was preached is true. <laughs> Tap your neighbor and say, everything you need is in the word of God. The word of God is given to us for everything pertaining to godliness and pertaining to life. When I was growing up, <clears throat> I used to love to watch my mother cook. My mother was one of them old school women who just loved to cook, first of all. But she would cook. Some of y'all tapping your wives now, right? <laughs> but she would cook every single day. I mean, I never remember my mother. She had leftovers. She might have eating that lunchtime, we had, but no, no, no. She cook a fresh meal every single day. I ain't saying you gotta do that. I'm just telling you about my mama. And she made everything from scratch and she was a baker. And so she always had pie and a cake or something that was gonna be on the table in the cake pan, right? And he got down about half a cake. She said, I better go on and bake a fresh cake because somebody might stop by. Ain't nobody coming by. If I ever came to that house, my daddy ate all of that. <laughs> but I used to love to watch her cook. I think I have a, somewhat of a passion for cooking now. I used to just wa watch her cook, only child, and I would watch her cook. Yeah, I was a mama's boy. I would watch her cook. And mama made everything from scratch. And every Friday, she would fry fish, and listen to this, she would cook spaghetti. Now, if you're from the South, it might be grits, but in Detroit, she cooked spaghetti. But it wasn't just like boil some noodles and throw some ketchup on it. No, 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 no. Mama took the tomatoes, chopped them up in her own way, pureed them before we had purators. She would take the onions fresh and just dice them up. She would take the oregano and the salt and the garlic and and, and, and the, the Italian uh, spices and, and put all of that in it. She would cut up the mushrooms and put that in there. I mean, everything that you, you, you could imagine that would make this thing taste good, she cut it up from hand and put it in there. And I watched her for years do that. And then I got to be a teenager. Mom's getting a little older. It was on Friday. I walk in the kitchen. I said, Mom, what you cooking? She said, I'm frying some fish. Better cook some spaghetti. So I said, okay, I'm going to sit at the table and watch her. So I'm waiting for her to take out the onions and the tomatoes and the mushrooms and all the spices. She went in the pantry and got a jar out <laughs> with this red stuff in it. Now, this is back in the day. I said, uh, Mama, you going to cut up the tomatoes? She said, no. I said, well, what about the onions and bell peppers? And she said, no, nah, I'm not going to do that today. I said, why not? She said, because everything I need is right here in this jar. <laughs> and I looked at it and it was ragu. And ragu, I didn't know it until the other day. I went back and did the research. Their slogan was, it's in the sauce. Everything that make this spaghetti taste good is already in the sauce. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Everything you will ever need is already in the book. It's in the book. Somebody say it's in the book. You just got to pop the top off of it and indulge. Am I right about it? Some of y'all ain't feeling too bad now about using ragu and prego, right? I wasn't going to tell this story, but I'm going to go ahead and tell it because I feel inspired from the top of my scalp. In closing, when we talk about the word of God as being all that we need, there's a preacher who lived in a small town. He pastored a church there, and he got into town. His car broke down on him in front of a bar. Couldn't get it started, so he goes inside the bar, make a phone call so he can call a tow truck, take his car to the shop. 
And so Gary would go into the bar, one of his old friends, who was one of the richest men in the, in the county, he came out, his clothes looking all beat up, weathered. He was drunk, disheveled looking. And he's, the preacher says to the man, I said, man, what's going on, man? Well, you're looking kind of bad. He said, I'm going through a bad time. He says, I'm, I'm losing everything, my business, my house, everything. I'm losing it all, man. Just turn into the alcohol now. I don't know how I'm going to cope. The preacher said, what you need to do, you need to turn your heart toward God. Go home. I know you got a Bible. And this is what I want you to do. This is how God's going to work. Just take your Bible, close your eyes, open it to wherever randomly, with your eyes closed, put your finger there, and whatever it is, when you open your eyes that you're pointing to, that's God's word for you and his instruction for you. He said, okay, I'll give it a shot, preacher. Went home. Two weeks later, the preacher came into town, saw the man get out of a fresh Mercedes Benz, designer suit on, had on a Rolex watch, big old smile on his face. He said, hey, Reb, thanks for the advice. He said, man, what happened to you? He said, I did exactly what you told me to do. I went home, got out my Bible, closed my eyes, just let it fall where the pages were lead, put my finger there, opened up my eyes. And he said, what did you see? I saw the words chapter 11. So I filed bankruptcy, <laughs> kept my stuff. I said, whatever you need, it's in the word of God. Amen. If you're looking for a job, it might, some people pronounce it Job, but just go there. Is that right? <laughs> whatever you need, it is in God and God has revealed his desires for you in his written word. Let us not deviate, but let us cherish the word of God. Soli, sola Scriptura, the Word of God alone. Let us pray.